to the part that you all want to know, scaling without failing. Fintechs, of course, want to scale fast. A costly mistake to make is not laying strong foundations to ensure customers' safety early on. Are fintechs truly thinking through their fraud prevention strategy, ranging from the type of clients they onboard, upcoming legislations to combat fraud, or evaluating the trends in CNP and friendly fraud? And I can tell you the last thing you want is the regulators knocking on your door asking these questions. What is the role of AI and ML? Join our panellists, please. Mark Tibble, CEO of ASL, Hayley Fisher, the country GM for Adyen, and Piers Cracknell, the GM for BC Payments, to look at what's under the hood in fraud prevention to keep your fintech safe. And moderating our panel is Elise Adams, a partner at Allens. Big hand for our late panel. And then you'll get some afternoon tea. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this session around scaling without failing. Um, as with everything in the payments landscape, the landscape surrounding scams and fraud is dynamic and changing at pace. And in, this is certainly the case for the development of um, preventative measures and tools across all of our businesses, but it's also um, the case for, for, for those who are the scammers and the fraudsters who are continually um, getting the better of, of consumers in this, in this industry. So nobody needs to tell the people in this room that the scams are a constant threat and bad actors are doing everything they can to come up with new cunning ways to target our consumers. So lastly alone, Australians lost over $2.7 billion via scams. Um, ha happily, that was down from the year before where it was over $3.1 billion worth that were lost through scams. But one of the key issues in this, in this, with those numbers, is obviously they're too big, but they also disproportionately target disadvantaged and vulnerable Australians. Um, the industry, as the industry works to transition from VEX to MPPP over the coming years, the ability for fintechs to rise to the opportunity of new time, of real time payments, is ever present. And so the question then becomes, how do we scale to the opportunity presented by the MPP without falling into the traps set by the scammers for our customers? So I'm joined by this excellent panel here today um, from three different payment organisations uh, to be able to share their own experiences and insights on that very question of how we can scale without failing in this space. So I might let each of our panel introduce themselves. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Uh Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Mark Tibbles. Uh, ASL is a licensed regulated bank providing access to payment rails across Australia through the, the BEX clearing system and through the MPP environment with, as well as others. Okay, thanks, Mark. Hayley? Uh, Hayley Fisher, the Adyen Country Manager for Australia and New Zealand. And Adyen is a global fintech and we enable enterprise merchants uh, with end-to-end -end payment capabilities, data-rich insights and financial products on a single uh, platform globally. Thanks. Okay, Piers. Uh, Piers Cracknell, GM for BT Payments Australia. Uh, we are the Australian arm of European bank called Banking Circle, and we uh, provide settlement and clearing capabilities for FIs, which includes banks and fintechs and cross-border solutions. Great, thanks very much. So we might start first with the here and now. And Piers, last year at Intersect, BC Payments announced its very welcome entry into the Australian market. Off the back of great international success, what's your journey to scaling in Australia look like to date and, and what challenges have you overcome during that journey? Um, yeah, yeah, so you're right. So we um, last year's Intersect, we announced the launch of BC Payments Australia, which was a really exciting uh, opportunity to align the two events with, with Intersect. Um, we also sponsored last year's Intersect and, and uh, really happy to sponsor the uh, event again this year. And that really speaks to the confidence that we have as an organization in Intersect and its ability to bring together the whole of ecosystem. Uh, whether it's regulators, policymakers, banks, and, and participants in, in, in the overall ecosystem. Um, so yes, last year we launched, um, and if I think about the last 12 months and what's happened since then, uh, the team size has grown, our client base has grown, our payment volumes have grown. If I think about our existing customers, they've been able to scale really well. Uh, our new client acquisition is, is, is working well, and that's executing nicely as well. So all the metrics are... 
um, kind of pointing in the right direction, and so the business is scaling nicely. Um, we went live with Bex as a as a payment rail initially, and uh, you know for us the the idea around that was to get uh, the foundations in place, getting used to processing uh, payment flows and customer flows on the Bex um, system to ensure that we've got really strong foundations in place because you know kind of when you're working with other banks and participants and the scheme rules you really need to understand things like recalls repairs rejections and so on um, we we've taken a very phased approach uh, in australia we always knew that we would at some point go live with an instant payment solution and so over the coming weeks we in turn will also be going live with our instant payment solution by leveraging the mpp and that's something that is very much firstly driven by client demand. Um, they are looking for uh, kind of instant payments. Not all payments need to be instant, but a lot of our customers do want that instant settlement capability. Um, but it also is a model and an approach that aligns very well with our European approach. So if I think about our European and UK operations, they originally started off in the batch schemes. They then progressed to the instant settlement schemes like UK faster payments and European CEFA uh, instance. Um, and so as an organization, we've gone through that process ourselves of going from batch to, uh, or analog to digital, or batch to real time, and then we've done that ourselves in Australia. So we've got that, uh, I guess, that experience of going through it ourselves as an organization, and that I think that really helps when you take organizations through that uh, process as well. Um, so yes, that, that's been our experience in the last 12 months. Excellent. It'd be good to pick your brain on some of the learnings from other jurisdictions later on. Hayley, Agin is of course a huge global player in the in the payments landscape and, and really on the front line when it comes to setting up merchants for success from fraud and, and scam prevention and things um, along those lines. So, you know, we know for example that CMP fraud is on the rise and really having a moment. Um, can you share with us some of the factors that, some of the things that factor into Agin's approach to help mitigate fraud risk? Sure, so when we think about mitigating risk, we think it from the Agium point of view and the customer journey. So from onboarding, going live to vigilance always. So if you think about onboarding, Agium has been very direct about the size and the types of merchants that we'll work with and the industries that we'll operate in. And then, and this basically means that we built our platform around servicing the needs of enterprise merchants. So when we work with enterprise merchants and they're onboarding, they're going through vigorous KYC, AML onboarding process. And while we try to build as many automated tools and solutions to make that as frictionless as possible, there is always a little bit of friction there. But we strongly believe that that helps mitigate the risk in our business. And then the merchants we're working with, we're really looking at the long-term value of working with that partner. And then once our merchants are up and running, then we think about what are those risk rules and fraud protections that our merchants need. So at Adyen, we're now processing over a trillion dollars a year annually. So we look at that volume at a global level. We look at it at a country by country, industry by industry, and then we take those best practices and help our merchants determine those risk rules. And as doing that, we leverage the data. So putting into machine learning, learning those trends, and then using it for our merchants. And then lastly, in terms of vigilance, we're consistently to periodic reviews of our merchants. So ensuring that they are compliant with the regulation today, and then also aware of the regulation, as we all know, it keeps on changing. Um, and then also for Adyen, how do we participate in this industry? There are so many working groups, I'm sure we all know that very well, but how do these working groups talk to each other? How do we make sure we're all working towards the end goal? So I personally think over the last few years, all these industries have got much stronger. There's more communication. There's more openness to sharing challenges and trends. And we look forward to seeing that continue. Yeah, great. Thanks, Hayley. And I think it's absolutely true that the regulation is continually moving. I think I've got whiplash from the last two weeks. Um, so, Mark, I know you've been at a part of many evolutions of this industry over a period of time and, and you're strongly of the view that fraud is a constant and evolving threat um, and that also consumer education plays a big part in helping to prevent some scams. And I, I think that 
you know, the government's come a, a, a been on board with that education process in the last few years and we are seeing some, some improvement, perhaps indicated a little bit by the, the numbers of, the lowering number of, of scan volumes over the last couple of years. But another shift that the government's made very recently, last week, amongst all of the other reforms, is, is to introduce the proposed um, new scams prevention framework, which will um, impose particular requirements on banks like ASL, telcos and digital platforms um, centred around six key principles. And I know that there's other discussions around this today, but just to touch on them for, for everybody here, they're around governance arrangements, um, prevention, prevention of scams, detection of scams, reporting of scams, disruption, and then responding to scams. So principles based at a high level, and, and they all sound pretty, um, pretty sensible approaches. Uh, are we taking the right steps forward with this legislation and more generally in, in the industry at the moment, Mark, or is there more that we could be doing? Uh, look, thanks, Elise. I think regulation is often a good thing, and I think having a framework that we can work towards helps everyone sort of play a single game. We talk about the scaling without failing and specifically focused on your reputation. So your reputation is built upon your ability to support customers uh, as a fintech mm. and create a safe and secure environment for them to make payments. Failure in that can be really catastrophic to you as an organisation. Mm. There is no silver bullet. So if we're investing a dollar to protect, we're investing two to find the weak points. So from that point of view, uh, I would actively encourage people to think through yourself as a consumer. So. What are the things that you need to see, think, hear, feel um, as you work with an organisation that's looking after your money? So, and from that perspective, what protections? If you're a fintech working with an organisation like ASL or BC Payments or Agent, know that they're going to come to you and say, what are you doing, not just initially, but ongoing? Mm. So I like to think of it as, we'll call it active reg regulatory, regulatory compliance. So helping you protect your customers and their customers. So from that point of view, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done under the framework, recognising it's not a silver bullet. Um, it will shift and change as we go along because as we close one door, another one opens. So we've already seen the scams pieces shifted down a little bit, but the merchant piece and the card not present force has gone back up again. That came down for many years and now it's mm. going back up. So as we shut one door, they open another one. As we shut that, they open another one. So they find cracks under the door. They find cracks in the wall. So they invest millions to find the weak points because that's an easy way for them to do it. Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And um, as the legal representative on the panel, I like the idea of active compliance with law. That's good. Um, so looking slightly ahead as we transition to the MPP, a question to all of you on the panel. What do you see as some of the challenges facing fintechs that are moving from batch to real time? And, and you know, Piers, I know you've got some international experience on that too, perhaps to bring to. Uh, yeah, so my personal view is that I'd still like Bex to be around in 2030 and we're not just solely reliant on MPP and one, uh, one payment rail because there's a whole load of um, risk attached to that, uh, particularly with downtime and, and, and so on. Um, and not all payments need to be instant, um, which is also something else to think about as well. And look, but Bex, is, Bex works perfectly well. It's been around for 50 years. It's done a great job. Um, it, we know the shortcomings uh, around maybe a kind of account lookup and it's you know really focusing on PSB and account number as opposed to name and, and so on. But that, that's been, uh, that's been uh, kind of solved for at the moment. And maybe some of the limitation around characters in, in the payment message. Um, but it worked. Hmm. Um, if I think about um, NPP, it's a totally different dynamic because, you know, BEX is Monday to Friday, there's five or six payment runs. It gives you the ability from a timing perspective to repair, reject, and, 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 and do all those type of things to, to, a, uh, to the payment file. Whereas, um, you know, going to an instant payment scheme, you don't have that luxury or flexibility as such. It's 24-7, 365, and that has implication when it comes to things like treasury. So as a, you know, as a, as a fintech organization, do you have enough liquidity to be meet your payment obligations, not just during the week, but over the weekend and long weekends and, and so on as well? And obviously with real-time payments comes real-time forward. So how do you as an organization deal with 
uh, fraud detection, fraud monitoring um, in a on a, on a real-time um, uh, setup. So um, there's also kind of some shortcomings when it comes to MVP that need to be considered. It is single line transfer or single line credit at the moment, whereas Bex can handle uh, bulk transfers like uh, like payroll. But that's well documented and, and well known, and there are some solutions in place that are being worked on at the moment to uh, overcome those issues. Um, um, the, the other thing I'll call out as well, if you're a fintech looking at MPP, where do you want to play as well? Because I think adoption at C2C level has grown well. Mm. At B2B level, maybe not so much, particularly around kind of pay too. So if you're an, or, if an organization focusing on that B2B segment, that's a consideration, you know, is it that you've probably got more growth there, but in the C2C section, it's more familiar to us because, you know, we are familiar at paying each other on, on an instant basis through an app uh, uh, type thing. So there's a, there's a couple of thoughts I have on that. Yeah, um, the need for speed <laughs> is a really interesting, um, so speed kills, right? So <laughs> I can guarantee you that a consumer, if you save them from losing money through a scam, they'll love you for it. So, and if that means that you need to push a payment down direct entry, then to give it 24 hours, they'll be okay. So, because you saved them 10 grand. Um, so, I think there's a really fine balance on when you should be doing it and when you shouldn't be doing it. Having things within your business that are transaction monitoring in real time. The ability to hold, suspend, release, communicate with customers. And I think things, when you combine the need for speed with things like CDR and being able to communicate a little bit more effectively about data with customers, then an ecosystem really starts to evolve because it becomes a user experience based ecosystem rather than a decisional based ecosystem. Mm. So I think from that point of view, sometimes we just need to stop and smell the roses a little bit and say, well, why, do we, why are we rushing to shut down a system that does work really well? So why, should it, why does a payment need to be in real time? So the fact is that I bought Pierce dinner and he has to pay me 50 bucks. Do I need it instantly or can I wait? Because I might not have bought him dinner. It just might be me taking money from Pierce's account. So from that point of view, I think we're obsessed with this kind of stuff, just like my 12-year-old daughter's obsessed with Mecca on Insta and, and so forth. I think we just need to step back and say, slow it down a little bit because people will thank us for us in the long run. I think that's true, but you're thinking from a consumer point of view, which is great. But if you also take it from a merchant point of view, they want to speed up payments, right? There's an instant mm. reliability now and comparing with other international markets of receiving your settlement faster, your payout faster, whether you're an insurance company, etc. So the whole world is going towards faster instant payouts. I believe that there is speed kills and there needs to be risk rules in place, but we also need to have risk rules that are clear and there's clarity in the market of what those risk rules are because as we do move to MPP and pay two, understanding what those rules are so we're setting our customers and our merchants up for success to know what they are and they don't keep changing. So we support there needs to be rules, but there also needs to be education and communication and a industry-wide of supporting that as well. Because um, it's going that way. I 100% agree with you. So uh, it's just making sure that we're making instant payments and fast payments for the right people at the right time for the right things. So and I think it's a really difficult judgment call to make. So me buying something for 10 grand for someone I've never dealt with before to do something through account to account that I saw on Facebook is probably not the need for speed that we expect. So, so I think it's just really trying to find a balance. And we talk about the broader use of data in payments. And I think as the models of AI and we'll call it machine learning evolve, I think that will help us get better. But right now it's a, it's a little bit early stages, but real time hold, suspend, I think can help everyone, unless you're known. If you're known, let it go. Yeah. And I think that's really true if you even if you step back from that customer perspective if you're getting the message from your mum that she needs fifty thousand dollars transferred to her account urgently or somebody's going to die no, her phone broke yeah that's right and and you're ready to fall for that you are wanting that speed right so the ability the forced ability to slow them down is absolutely on their side but not something that the consumer thinks about in that moment yeah um, I think it's really interesting also to 
to touch on those risk rules, Hayley, because, you know, they are certainly an evolving thing within our organisations and I think it sort of ties in a little bit with some of the reform we've seen lately where it may not be that each of the each of the uh, entities you guys represent here today will be regulated in, in all of the different ways under the reforms that we've seen. But I do think it will impact more broadly the risk rules and the settings across the entire ecosystem because you will have people like perhaps the banks who are regulated uh, requiring additional information so that they can meet their own risk rules and requirements that are flowing down from the legislation. And so I think it is one of those things where we might see a ripple effect more broadly than just the initial, the actual regulated entities. Look, I think as a regulated entity, so we don't have customers, so we're a bank, but we're not really a bank, so to speak. We've got the ability to hold money and so forth, but we don't have consumers. So I think the natural thing for us to do is consider, well, who's connected to our network and how do we help the regulator regulate them, so to speak. And I think elements of CPS 230, that is the APRA standard or the prudential standard, will sort of start to come in. And I yeah. think there's, having caught up with the Reserve Bank recently, the focus of resilience across the network. So again, all of these things are sort of combining. And Mr. Jones this morning with his discussion around the Scams Act and so forth. So there's all parts of government that are involved in this now. So I think as a fintech, when you're thinking about, you know, what are the implications to you, I think just having them at the top of mind, and they can't just be something that you've done and then put away. It needs to be something that gets done because everyone's going to expect that it's actively worked upon. So it's actively dealt with every day within your business. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think it ties in with various of the reforms we've seen in the last couple of weeks because they will throw f flow through at that level. You've got the regulators taking a much more uh, uniform approach to things like scams and, and consumer protection. And, you know, we're seeing that with what we suspect will come through with cyber reforms in the, in the next sitting. Um, and we've certainly seen it with some of the changes to the AML Act with, you know, loosening the tipping off rule a little so that we can share a bit of information so that we are actually enabling each other as a community to help, you know, tackle scams and fraud at, at that level. So I think that's absolutely right. I, I think some of the... Some of the framework that's been put in place really helps us educate our consumers mm. so on what payments they should be making yeah. as opposed to what payments they want to make. So, so there's going to be a lot of work and it, it's never going to stop. So it's going to be there every day. It might come in different forms or through different ent uh, people or, or entities. But ultimately, I think we all need to hold or understand that we're going to be held accountable for the the traffic that flows across our networks and that we're doing everything possible to make sure that those protections are in place. Yep. And that's also sharing best practices across the industry with all these working groups that we're part of and how we're sharing those challenges and those trends. We need to keep doing that and sharing that internationally. Yep. Yeah, because the regulators will be sharing information at that level now, I think is really clear, yeah. Um, so then on the topic of continually evolving, one question that I'm keen to ask is if, is if you can give us any learnings from other sophisticated markets offshore where they have had some good wins in this space and is there things that you think we could be doing here or that we may be seeing in the near future in this market? I'm going to be a little controversial here and I'm going to say I think we've been stalling on a, on a I'll call it a robust digital identity framework here mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's a missing link. I'm not quite sure how to solve the problem but at some point in time a consumer needs to understand um, and a merchant for that matter, that we need a way of actually confirming the people that we're dealing with in a digital world, so where everyone's remote and nobody's seen and so forth. So th the ability to, to hold credentials for someone else within your own environment is, is a real challenge. So I know that there's been a lot of stop starts and many markets have actually pushed down this path and nobody think has, I think has solved it unless you're in a fully controlled market, mm. some. Mm. Um, but I think we need to invest in, in what's a digital identity framework that, will that people will support. I think we need to stop thinking along the lines of 100% of people need to hold it. Yeah? So if you can get 75% of people that are buying stuff online or thinking of doing stuff online who have an understanding and want to know who's got their data and what they're using it for, then we need to bring the CDR piece, a digital identity piece, a, a real-time payments piece all together to actually help people make informed choices. So whether they be on the merchant side or on the on the facilitator side or on the on the buyer side. Yeah. 
Hayley, any other learnings from offshore that you think we might start to see here or trends? Now, when I think about uh, fraud and risk, I look at what's happening with 3DS2 and other countries, so with Malaysia and Hong Kong mandating it, now for Japan mandating credit cards, all going via 3DS in early 2025. If this is a trend, right? We've seen it in Europe, we're seeing it in Asia. How it will factor in here and we review it as the card not present framework working in its current way and I know we'll have the review of that again uh, but definitely definitely watching that. Yeah. Piers, anything else from you? I'd, I'd probably look at the UK for a couple of examples. Um, the UK faster payment scheme can be used to settle the domestic leg of a cross-border payment originated overseas and obviously that's coming in uh, to NPP now as well through the international payment service. The, the, the challenge is if you think domestic real-time fraud detection or fraud detection in, in domestic payments is hard, then international payments is even harder. Um, so that's something that needs to be very much uh, thought through and some banks will have very advanced fraud detection um, systems that can be applied to cross-border payments and others will have to lift in that regard. Um, I think secondly as well, the, what the UK have done around their shared liability on approach to frauds and scams is um, probably not a particularly good example. I think Australia is tackling this in a much better way. It's a very much a whole of ecosystem approach. And there, there is so much scams awareness uh, at the moment. I, mean, I left Sydney Airport uh, on Monday. There was uh, an advert uh, there about the ANZ uh, Falcon mm -hmm. um, uh, solution. You get to, you get to Melbourne, there's a there's an advert about NAB, say, for payments and online banking. There's in-app notifications. It, it's everywhere. You, you can't escape it. But I think the way that the UK have approached it with the shared liability scheme is, is probably not working, I think, is, is my view on that. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think it's certainly, certainly not necessarily something we uh, will readily run to adopt here until it's gone through a little bit more of a, a process of review. Mike, did you have something? Uh, look, the only thing I'd probably close with from my perspective is just to, your reputation is built upon your ability to support payments. And that's not just the reputation that you have with your customers so mm -hmm. at the end. So the reputation that you have with your partners that connect you into the network can often sort of lead to the outcomes that you don't want. So if you're not necessarily doing the things that you should be doing on your side, then as a regulated entity, we're held accountable for your actions. Mm -hmm. So. Ultimately, I think we'll get to the point, we'll have a better understanding that if you're not doing the right thing, if you're not actively managing it, then we will stop it. So I think to Pierce's point in terms of shared liability models and, and so forth, you, you can't stop that. We, we still can't stop, despite the ads that appear everywhere and the, and the, the press, we can, still can't stop people pressing on links in Facebook Marketplace and punching out 10 grand to people. It just, I don't know how we do it, but I think We've just got to take little steps along the way, use the framework as our friend, and make sure that we're doing everything we can to help people that, to protect themselves at a merchant level, as a, at a corporate level, and as a consumer level. Yeah. Well, anything final from you, Hayley or Piers, on what we can help do to help our, our friends here in the room scale to success in this current environment? Yeah, I think it's, it's prevention and getting ahead of it, right? We cannot rely on the... Um, the end result of fraud, we need to be in front of it and enabling ideally with tools and service and solutions that can help block fraud. So getting in front of that, understanding it, sharing those learnings, and then figuring out what are the, what's your risk appetite? What are the types of merchants and business that you want to be working with and building your business around that? I agree, you took my point. <laughs> but, uh, I agree with that. It's about onboarding the right customers and having uh, confidence in your own client onboarding processes. Uh, and, and as much as it can have some friction in the process, it's for the right outcome because you want the right actors on, on, your, uh, uh, on, on your bales. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much to our wonderful panel and hopefully you all got some tips for being able to scale. Thank, thank you, you to Mark, thank you to Hayley, thank you to Pierce and of course thank you to Elise for that wonderful session.